guest today is a lifelong Chicagoan. In 1998, he joined the Chicago school system, leading the magnet school program, where he achieved some dramatic improvements, and two years later was named Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public Schools. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the City Club of Chicago, the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Public School System, Arnie Duncan. Arnie? Thank you so much, Jay. And for the two or three people in this room who Jay didn't acknowledge, I apologize. And I'm very glad you're here. <laughs> it's, it's great to be back. And, and I thought I'd begin by really just taking a minute to talk you through what's, what's definitely the most enjoyable part of my job and arguably the most important. And that's the time I spend every week visiting schools. I think that's the one chance to get real honest feedback to walk the hallways and talk to teachers and talk to principals and talk to students and parents and really get a sense of what's working and what's not. I wanted to take a minute to sort of walk you through what I've learned. Uh, since the school year started in September, I've been in 57 schools. I didn't realize it was that many. We sort of counted up last week. But the lessons have been absolutely invaluable. On the first day of school, we went out to the new Lindblom High School. Lindblom was a school that was a great high school when I was, when I was uh, in high school 20, 25 years ago had fallen on hard times. We actually closed it down, uh, put about $20 million into the building, put a great new principal at Limbloom, Alan Mather. Alan Mather was a former assistant principal of Northside College Prep, arguably the best high school in the state. He walked away from that opportunity to start up the new Limbloom in the heart of Englewood. Just in the first couple months so far, that, that new high school, Limbloom, has had a 96% attendance rate, 10% better than high schools across the board. A couple weeks after that, I took Senator Barack Obama to visit the new Al Raby School at the Lucy Flower Campus on the heart of the west side. This again was another school that had historically struggled. Two years ago, we put in a dynamic, great new principal, Janice Jackson. She went through a very, very competitive process with a bunch of other groups that wanted to open a new school there. She, brought a, she was a former great Chicago public school teacher, brought a team of teachers with her. They started last year with 125 freshmen. This year as they came back, they had 121 sophomores coming back all at the heart of the West Side. We never see those kinds of numbers. Obviously, we worry a lot about dropout rate between the freshman year and sophomore year. She brought 121 of those 125 students back, and they are absolutely committed to doing something very, very special there. I spent an afternoon at Kenwood Academy in Hyde Park, where I live. They have simply a, a remarkable program called the Brotherhood, where they have about 100 young men, almost all of whom are African American, who are really the hip kids in school who are doing everything they can to create something very, very new, positive peer pressure. Rather than joining gangs, rather than pressuring people to drop out, rather than being hip to not, good, good, not get good grades, these young men are doing study hall every single week together. They're pulling their peers along who are struggling. If the student's thinking about dropping out, they hear about it weeks, months before an adult ever would have any clue what's going on. And those young men are really starting to steer a dramatically different course there. Weekends, they're out doing community service in the neighborhood. And if you had 100 young men in a gang doing something, that'd be front page news. But somehow, what these young men are doing on a daily basis, no one's picked up. But it's really started something, I think, very, very special. I also spent an afternoon at Williams Multiplex. Williams, as you may remember, was one of the schools we actually closed three years ago. It was one of our first Renaissance schools. We kept that school closed for a year, took a year to plan and work with the community, and we've had two years of results since that school has reopened. We spent an afternoon with the parents, who have been the parents who are most angry at yelling at President Scott and I a couple years ago, why are we closing Williams? They thought we were going to sell the building for condos. They sort of believed all the conspiracy theories. We spent an afternoon with them, and they went on and on about how appreciative they were for the dramatically different climate there today. And the results are actually stunning. Over the last two years, the same children, same children who were there before, they left for a year, came back, had been there two years, same socioeconomic challenges, same neighborhood, right in the heart of the projects. Those same students are performing, um, I'll give you just a backup where they were. The year before they left on the Iowa test, you're supposed to gain one year's of growth, 1.0, a year's growth for your instructions. Those students had gained about a month. It's just heartbreaking how much they hadn't got. They had gone up instead of 1.0, they got up 0.15. Over the past two years, on average, they've been gaining almost two years of learning, two years of growth per year of instruction. It's like 18 times better than what was going on before. It just gives you some sense.
it gives you some sense of how critically important high expectations are when community comes together. Don't let anyone tell you what poor children can't do. With real opportunity, with real guidance, it is extraordinary what they can do. It's like they're sponges. They're soaking up all the stuff they didn't get prior. It was amazing to see the parents' reaction to what was happening there. And then finally, twice in the past couple months, I visited South Loop Elementary, which is absolutely one of the best turnaround uh, stories for one of our neighborhood schools in the city, not very far from here. It's a school that was really a school of last resort that everyone in the community is excited about. We've got a wonderful new principal, and this fall we opened up a new pre-K wing where we have six classrooms of pre-K, tremendous range of socioeconomic backgrounds, race, you name it, to go there and see the mix of children in that community is just absolutely heartwarming. It's exactly the type of environment that I'd want for my two young children going forward. So I, ju I just give you those lessons to let you know some of, the th some of the things that are happening out there, some of the things we're seeing, and, and how much it leaves me convinced that we're really on the right track and that our three core strategies of literacy and human capital and developing more learning opportunities are exactly the right things. We need to continue to challenge ourselves every year to focus and hone those strategies and continue to take our system to the next level. In terms of literacy, Barb Reese and Watkins and her team have done an extraordinary job. This year, for the first time, we are assessing students three times a year, not a high-stakes test, a no-stakes test, simply an evaluation to get for the first time ever real-time data on every child, third through eighth grade, to find out what their strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and then to work with parents and with teachers to change instruction during the school day, after school, work with parents on the weekends to really figure out how we help every student learn. It's fascinating when you think about all the test data we've had historically, while schools are held accountable, and we as a district are held accountable, that's fine. That test data never helped an individual child learn. We always get those results over the summer, and then they're on to the next school year. For the first time ever now, three times during the year, we can look at what students' strengths are, what their weaknesses are, which teachers are really moving students, which teachers aren't, how do we continue to get better, and we'll come back next year with a math assessment the same way. On the human capital side, every time I'm here, I talk about trying to create a climate where we bring in the best and brightest from around the country who are passionate about public education. Uh, Jay mentioned a couple of our team members earlier. If I could just take a minute and, and ask, all, ask all of our team members here, as, as well as our other board members, Rufus and Roxanne, all of our team members to please stand. It's an extraordinary management team. Can I ask them all to stand up, please? One of the things I'm absolutely most proud of is the caliber of talent and the pa passion and the commitment and the, and the belief that this group has that we can become the best big city school district in America. We're not going to stop until we get there. Um, also on the human capital side, we talk so much about trying to bring in great, great teachers. And Dave Vitale and his team, the HR team, have done just an extraordinary job. Some of you may remember all the, the, uh, the impending studies of doom about this huge teacher shortage that was going to hit Illinois. Let me just give you a couple quick numbers. Uh, four years ago, we, we had 9,000 teachers apply, went to 12,000 to 15,000. Then this past uh, fall when we opened school, we had over 17,000 teachers apply to come teach in Chicago public schools. We've almost doubled from 9,000 to 17,000 the number of teachers who want to come work with us. We had about 1,700 jobs, so we had 10 applicants for every position. It's unprecedented numbers. The number that probably staggered me the most, 42% of those applicants came to us with master's degrees. I actually thought the number was wrong. We had to go back and check it. It was absolutely right. We're also hiring a huge number of alter alternatively certified teachers, remarkable people coming out of business and coming out of other industries who want to come in and make a difference in our students' lives. And so we have this remarkable chance to really reinvigorate the workforce, bring in great, great talent to replace that baby boomer generation that's moving out, and continue to work very hard to do a better job of supporting this great talent once it comes to Chicago public schools. And then our third core strategy of more learning opportunities, I break that into a couple different areas. We have to start younger, so we try and increase every single year the number of early childhood slots. We have to get to our children, not at kindergarten as late, but at three years old and four years old. Governor Bogoyevich has been very helpful on the funding side. We hope next year to get over 30,000 children in Chicago public school pre-K slots, going up by about 2,000 every single year. Another huge push has been to make our schools community schools. Beth Swanson, here, who's run that effort, we think schools closing down at you know, 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon just doesn't make any sense. Our schools have to be open 10, 12, 13, 14 hours a day every day with a wide variety of very high quality programming for our students and for their parents after school. In 2002, we made a commitment that by 2007, we wanted to have 100 community schools. 
Actually, as we opened this, this school year, this fall, 2005, we had 120 community schools out there in neighborhoods around the city, two years ahead of that commitment. And what we're seeing across the board is just a, a attendance going up, truancy going down, mobility going down, test scores going up, and families really getting engaged in their children's education. I'm absolutely convinced that when families learn together, they're huge educational dividends for our students. And then finally, in terms of more learning opportunities, not just getting children earlier, not just longer days, but more new schools. We have the Renaissance 2010 initiative, which Hosanna Mahaley, my chief of staff, leads. And our commitment is to create 100 great new schools in Chicago, specifically in neighborhoods that have historically been underserved. And it's just been amazing to see what's gone on. This past fall, we opened with 22 new schools. Of those 22 schools, 99.5% of the seats are taken. The vast majority of those schools already have waiting lists. You know, as I said earlier, we try and spend a lot of time listening and listening to parents and listening to students and listening to community leaders. And what they're desperately telling us is they want more great schools and neighborhoods that have been underserved for far too long. So we plan to open at least 15 more new schools next fall. And we're going to continue to push very, very hard in that effort going forward. And as we strive to constantly improve with our three core strategies, we're also pushing for a fundamental cultural change in which our improvements and therefore our power radiate not from the, from the bureaucracy, but from our school leaders. First, we believe the school and not the central office is the primary unit of change, and we're doing everything we can to empower our great principles. We've taken 82 of our schools, very high-performing schools, and basically freed them from the bureaucracy and told those principals, you've done a great job academically, you've done a great job financially, you're doing great with the community, let's get the bureaucracy off the back, you, after your back. You push change, you push innova innovation, let us learn from you. It's trying to build a real culture of trust. I think historically we've always managed to the lowest common denominator where we have challenges, we need to deal with those openly and honestly. But we have real, real stars and we have some extraordinary stars in the system. Let's give them the room to create. Let's get out of their way. Let's t let them know we trust them. Let's learn from them. And then frankly, it helps us move scarce resources to those schools that really do need help. So we've had significant changes there. Secondly, we're trying to listen to our teachers in unprecedented ways. Teachers consistently told Barbara and I that we were over-testing, and guess what? We agreed. I mean, this year, for the first time, we dropped the Iowa test. We've never done that before. A test has gone on for 30 years. We really didn't need that. We had the state test, the ISAT. We think it's a good test. We think it's a fair test. Um, we're held to those standards. No Child Left Behind laws tied to the state accountability standards. So we said, let's just focus on one high-stakes test. Let's do the other evaluation we talked about earlier. But let's stop over-testing our students. The second big thing that we put in place this year is we picked the 23 best teachers from each of our areas. In fact, we didn't pick them. The fellow teachers picked their own. And we asked them, who are those real stars? And the, the, the people they came forward with, the individuals, are just some extraordinarily committed teachers who are going way beyond the call of duty. We had a great, great recognition celebration for them. But I think much more importantly, we've put together what we call the Drive Award uh, Teacher Leadership Council. That's a group I meet with every month, and they're giving me extraordinary feedback about what's working in the system, what's not. They have some fairly radical ideas about what we should be doing with teachers. They're pushing for excellence. They're pushing for high standards. And I think giving voice to those great teachers is critically important, and I'm learning a tremendous amount from them every single month. And then finally, we're trying to do a much better job of listening to our students. We went out and surveyed our high school uh, students. We did forums. We did a high school summit. And it was fascinating to hear what they were saying. The big thing they were saying is, your expectations are too low. You're not challenging enough. We need more. You need to step up. And from those conversations, we've come up with this very, very ambitious high school transformation plan you may have heard of, where we want to, come, we want to become the first school district in the country to move at the high school level from pockets of excellence, islands of excellence, to really a system of excellence. And that whole initiative is really being driven by what we heard from our students who are saying, we, we demand better, we need more, we need to be better prepared both for jobs and for going to for college, and we have to help them get there. Because of all these efforts, we've made uh, steady progress over the past couple of years. I think you know many of the numbers. We're very pleased to report that elementary test scores are at all-time highs, high school test scores are at all-time highs, Reading scores are at all-time highs. Our eighth graders are beating national norms for the first time ever. Uh, that would have been unimaginable a few years back. You may have seen in uh, your paper not too long ago in the Sun-Times, the three best high schools in the state today are Chicago Public High Schools. Who could have imagined that 10 years ago? Yeah. Three best high schools are here. 
Jones High School is, is climbing very rapidly. The, the neighborhood school here, some of you might know, wonderful Principal Don Friend there. I think they're like eighth. That's moving right up the ladder. And keep an eye on Limloom that I talked about earlier of Allen Mather. You watch over that over the next couple of years, you're going to see some real rapid growth there. Uh, first day attendance was an all-time high, and many of the negative indicators, truancy, mobility, dropout rates, you name them, are all at all-time lows. So we feel very good about the direction we're going, but we know we have a heck of a long way still to go. There's so much that we know is going right in our schools. We have the right strategies in place and the right people to carry them out. And we know what it takes to get to the next level. My concern, however, is that the yearly budget challenges will put this progress at risk. This year, CPS must consider an increase in high school class size. We don't want to do this because it's absolutely a step backwards. But we may have to, depending on what happens in Springfield over the next couple of months. For the first time, we're taking $75 million from our reserve fund, which helps protect our bond rating and allows us to borrow money at favorable interest rates. For the first time, we're looking at special education, which serves our neediest students. Special ed mandates are issued by the federal and state governments, but they don't provide nearly enough funding to meet those mandates. Taxpayers locally have to make up that difference. This year, we're even looking at our core initiatives, the reading and math programs, the after-school and preschool programs, our small schools initiative. We have been pushing harder than ever to bring money into this system so that we can actually expand these critical, critically important initiatives. The mayor has called for more funding for new schools, and the Chicago business community has stepped up, committing to raise $50 million for Renaissance 2010. In just a year and a half, more than half that money is already in hand. The mayor has also pushed for more learning opportunities after school and in the summer. He's helped raise tens of millions of dollars to fund over 100 community schools that are open 12, 13, 14 hours a day. The mayor, along with his wife Maggie, have raised millions each year for after school programs and we're now launching a new effort to fund even more summer activities this summer. The mayor has gone to Washington to fight for more federal dollars for preschool and for Head Start. Governor Blagojevich has also done his share by dedicating more state money to early, child, early childhood programs each year. Everybody's trying, but the blunt fact of the matter is that it's not enough. With 75% of our operating dollars going to teacher salaries and benefits, our annual costs increase about 7% each year. Chicago gets less money to spend per child in education than almost all other major cities, including LA, New York, and DC. And just to give you one example, New York spends almost $4,000 more per student than Chicago every single year. Multiply that by 400,000 students here in Chicago, and that adds up to $1.6 billion annually. Imagine what we could do with those kinds of resources. As a state, Illinois covers less of the overall cost of education than every other state in the nation except Nevada, which uses local gambling revenues. Next year, our operating budget hole starts at $328 million. Closing that gap will not be easy, but I want to walk you through a few, a few of our numbers just to show you what's on the table, because it won't be impossible. It's just going to be painful. If we take $75 million from our fund balance, we can bring that gap down right away to about 250. We'll have to pay it back at some point, but it helps us next year, and it should not affect our high bond rating. If the state does another $100 million for Chicago next year, we can get that hole down to $150 million. So far, the Illinois State Board is talking about something like $70 million more for Chicago. We'll see what the governor and the General Assembly do this spring, but we are hopeful. To date, the governor has increased the foundation level by over $600 during his term, and it's clear that they want to do more this year but we don't know exactly how much. Under any circumstances, we're going to have to keep cutting. If we get $25 million more from administration and we're committing to doing that, our hole is down to $125 million. We also think we can find another $15 million at the schools outside of the classroom, which we've also done every single year. That still leaves over $100 million more that we need to find, and this is where it gets difficult to avoid cuts in the classroom. One other option, which is very controversial, is to get some relief from the state law requiring CPS to put $70 million into our teacher pension fund each year. It requires legislative approval that won't be forthcoming unless we have the support of the teacher union, and even then, it is by no means certain. 
What I can say is that our teacher pension fund is much healthier than the downstate teacher pension fund, and there's little risk to retirees if we can find a way to get some relief this year and over the long term. One last option, and it's always our last option, is to raise property taxes. The mayor has always put children first. And he's helped us make the case to property taxpayers for more dollars for schools, even when, even when he has held the line at the city and the park district and other agencies under his control. Local taxpayers have been extraordinarily supportive of our efforts, and we are grateful that they have to stay the course with us year after year. But before we ask local taxpayers for another nickel, however, we need to see what we can get from the state and what we can get from ourselves. We need to push hard for pension relief, so there's a lot of uncertainty at this point, a lot of moving parts. One thing, however, is absolutely certain. Illinois, which ranks 49th in the country in terms of the state share of education and 43rd in the country in terms of equity in funding, needs education funding reform. Year after year, the call for reform gets louder and the need gets greater. The 54 largest school districts in the state are unanimous in collaborating and calling for funding reform. 271 suburban and Collar County mayors are calling for funding reform. Coalitions with small school districts from the south and western suburbs have also joined that call. If you travel the state, as I did with a small group last year, you hear heartbreaking stories of school districts canceling classes, closing successful schools for budget reasons, raising class size, eliminating summer school and after school programs, and doing many things that hurt children, all because they don't have enough money. We're getting closer each year to the tipping point because property taxpayers are also reaching their limits. And let me make one point absolutely clear. The call for more money must be tied directly to a much broader vision of education reform. Illinois is trapped in mediocrity. We don't have a vision for what education should be in the 21st century. As a state, we need to embrace new ideas and new approaches. We can't have over 879 separate school districts each with their own bureaucracy that sucks resources out of the classroom. Consolidation is absolutely the right thing to do, particularly for the tiny districts around the state, and we have to stop doing business as usual there. School districts all around Illinois should embrace Chicago's willingness to close failing schools. We need real accountability. We can't keep sending good money after bad. It's not fair to our taxpayers, and it's not fair to our children. As we have learned here, there are tremendous educational benefits to creating new schools with a new sense of hope, vision, and promise, and with the highest of expectations. All of Illinois needs to adopt innovative learning approaches like charter schools, higher pay for outstanding teachers, or in areas of critical need like special education, math, and science. We should offer bonuses for great teachers who choose to work in our struggling schools. We should better reward nationally board certified teachers so that more teachers will pursue that higher training. In any business, you, know, you want to incent your best to continue to learn and grow, and that's what national board certification does. Building a statewide consensus around a single education reform will take enormous amount of effort from thousands of people, and I have no illusions that it will happen this year with a short legislative session planned and an election to follow. That's why I'm pushing for more money in the short term. But whoever is elected next fall must immediately take the lead on education reform, or they will bear direct responsibility for moral crime against children. This is the state's moment of truth. Will Illinois aspire to greatness in the new century, or will it perpetuate a second-rate education system? If we want business to locate here, if we want good-paying jobs for families, if we want to produce a generation of leaders who can compete in the global economy, there is only one path forward. And thanks to Hurricane Katrina, everyone in America now knows what we have known here in Chicago for many years. Education is the most important weapon in the war on poverty. The lesson for me in New Orleans is not about levees and floods and FEMA. It's a tragic reminder that dysfunctional public schools breed intergenerational poverty. If they rebuild New Orleans and don't do something dramatically differently with their schools, that same intergenerational poverty will continue. 
Education is the only way out. That's why the mayor took on education here in Chicago 10 years ago when everyone thought that was political suicide. That's why he took control of the CHA seven years ago. He knew that a city that ignored and isolated one segment of its population would never fulfill its potential. He knew that if we prepared every child in every school with the skills they need for life, our neighborhoods, our, our economy, and our city would all grow stronger. Because of the mayor's commitment, I can stand here today and tell you that Chicago is doing more than any other city to lift its most vulnerable citizens out of poverty. Chicago is doing more than any other city to bridge the economic and social divide that isolates the poor and denies them opportunity. And that's why I'm so hopeful. The mayor's put his reputation on the line and rallied the entire city to get involved. Our Board of Education and our extraordinary president, Michael Scott, has shown courage and leadership on issue after issue, supporting and demanding bold action to improve our schools. The Chicago Teachers Union is a full partner with us, helping to turn around some of our toughest schools and joining with, joining with us to challenge our current teacher evaluation system that is absolutely broken and pilot with us innovative new ideas for peer evaluation. Universities today can no longer be accused of being Ivy Towers. They are fully involved and engaged in actually running our schools, training teachers, and supporting our aggressive alternative certification agenda. They are also reshaping the high school curriculum to help us meet the higher standards our kids need and deserve. The business community is raising money for new schools and other learning programs, helping drive change within the system and pushing for innovation. The philanthropic community is united in the support of our efforts and has been extremely generous, both with their money and, just as importantly, with their ideas. We are hearing more and more voices of support from the, from the religious and political leaders who understand the importance of education in improving communities. Father Mike Flager at St. Sabina led the call for a new Calumet High School. Reverend Jesse Jackson joined the call for greater equity and funding, pointing out the differences between Harper High School on the south side and suburban high schools that receive twice as much money per pupil. Senator Miguel Devalle has been a champion for education funding reform. Parents and community leaders all across Chicago have volunteered hundreds and hundreds of hours to shape the great new schools that we're starting in underserved neighborhoods as part of Renaissance 2010. With so many people rowing in the same direction, I absolutely believe in my heart that we have a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to transform public education in Illinois. So as you leave here today, take a moment and think about what that would mean to our students at Kenwood or South Loop or to our principals at Limbloom and Al Raby, Alan Mather and Janice Jackson, and to our parents and children at schools like Williams. Today, I want to appeal to each of you to keep in your mind that image of a child in a classroom, or that young adult in a cap and gown with a, with a diploma that truly prepares him both for college and for work. Keep in mind that dedicated and passionate teacher who is making deep and personal sacrifices every single day to overcome the odds in a school system where more than eight out of 10 children live below the poverty line. Think about that principal shouldering the enormous burden of running schools with a thousand children, each with their own special needs and unique dreams. Think of them and think what you can do to help us reach our goal of creating the best school system in America because we cannot do it without you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, now we're going to have questions. You announce your name, and uh, I want all the people who ask questions stand by the microphone there so the camera can get them. Go ahead, please. Arnie, Diana Nelson with the Cross City Campaign. I have um, two questions, but I'd first like to compliment you on your passion and your dedication to Thank the you. students of Chicago. It is appreciated. My questions are these. You and your budget director, Pedro Martinez, have announced plans to go to per-pupil allocation budgeting. 
which would mean that when those hard decisions have to be made, they would be made at the school level by the principals that you say are um, in need of making those decisions and having more autonomy. Um, last year it was going to be this year. This year it's going to be next year. How close are you actually to moving toward per pupil budgeting so that the decisions, instead of being, a, being made at central office, will be made at the schools? And then I have one other question, if I may. Um, the 23-year-old central area TIF is set to expire next year. Um, it skims off money from the schools, has for 23 years. And I am wondering if you and your staff are going to oppose efforts to extend that in Springfield next year, which would bring um, millions of dollars into the system. Uh, two very thoughtful questions, and just appreciate all your hard work on these issues. On the, the sort of funding, moving the funding to the school level, we're actually doing that, as you know, with many of the new schools. So we're really trying to get out there. What we're always trying to do, Diana, is this is a large system. You have over 600 schools, and you want to, before you do anything system-wide, you really want to get a sense of what works, what doesn't. Uh, get the kinks out before you expand. But we have a number of pilots going. The basic premise is that I absolutely believe the school is a unit of change. I believe principals are CEOs. We need to hold them accountable. The great ones we need to reward and send. The bad ones we need to move them out. And the more we you know, give them the, res the resources, then hold them accountable and responsible for results. That's the right thing to do. So we're actually into that game as we speak. We're going to learn, get the kinks out, learn what, what doesn't, you know, what works, what doesn't. And we'll see about expanding you know, going from that point on. On the TIF, I don't know the intricacies of that specific TIF. As you know, TIF funding has been the only source of new school construction we've had here in Chicago for a couple of years. The last two years, we received no money from the state in terms of capital, zero dollars. We were supposed to receive $220 million from the state and receive zero. I didn't even sort of talk about the capital challenges here. Um, but the only new school construction we've been able to do has been through the TIF projects. We'll look at that one spe uh, specifically and see what our, our opinion is. Thank you. There's a shy guy there. Tell us when you're going to be on television next. Since you asked, Tom. Jeff Berkowitz, host and producer of Public Affairs, airing every Monday night at 8.30 on cable channel 21 throughout the city of Chicago, CAN TV. Right there. <laughs> and tonight's show, Christine Sigalis, Lindy Scott, two of the three Democratic primary congressional candidates in the 6th Congressional District. That's 8.30 tonight. Superintendent, Superintendent uh, Arnie Duncan, you've spoken eloquently, and you alluded to this here today, about how well public school choice is doing. You mentioned that, or you spoke about that extensively on Craig Delamore's At Issue program a few months ago. You referred to Providence St. Mel coming in to run one of your schools, the International Baccalaureate program, charter schools, all sorts of public school choice. You said innovation. You said parents are smart. They make good choices and you respect them. So my question to you is, rather than go down to Springfield and ask for more money, why don't you go down and ask them to give you authority to give choice, complete choice, to your parents? Let them go if they like, not just to the public schools, but to the private schools. Let them go if they like, not just to the uh, sectarian schools, but to secular schools. That will pop up if you take that $11,000 per year, per kid, that you're currently spending in the Chicago Public Schools. Give each of those 435,000 students the $11,000, put it in my famous backpack here, zip it up, strap that backpack on the kid. If the kid is as happy as you say and likes those schools we talked about, they stay there. The, the kids goes there, the backpack stays there, the cash stays there. But if they want to go out, they do, so why not give them that choice and let you can compete and they can? Thank you. We only have an hour, but go ahead. Um, just, let me give you a little level of detail on the complexity of the budget. You talk about $11,000 per student, which actually isn't accurate. We actually have a set of students, the vast majority of general education students, that we spend six, $7,000 per year on. If you go to Latin or Lab or Parker or New Trier, that's fifteen, sixteen, seventeen thousand dollars. We have another set of special education students and students that need to learn English that we spend nine, ten, eleven thousand dollars on. We have another set of special education students with some severe needs who we spend twenty-five thousand dollars or more on. But the, my basic point is 
the average student in Chicago is desperately underfunded relative to other places. And if you don't deal with that core issue, anything else you're doing is kidding yourself. I love choice. I love competition. We've talked here before about trying to partner in some innovative ways with the Archdiocese. I've talked about how I hate to see those Catholic schools that are good schools close for financial reasons. I've talked about the idea of those schools becoming charter schools, and we would help to fund them. And we continue to, to play with those kinds of ideas in the Cardinals exploring options. We need more great schools in Chicago, more great public schools, more great private schools, more great Catholic schools. But as long as the playing field is not even, as long as children in Chicago in the south suburbs and rural Illinois are getting half to a third of the money spent in their education each year than children elsewhere, we have a fundamental problem we have to address. Thank you. <laughs> yes, ma'am. My name is Mary Sharon Riley. I am a retiree of the Chicago Public School System, former president of the pension fund. And whenever I hear someone talk about taking money from a pension fund, our pension fund, it really worries me. I know that you talk about 70 million for this year, possibly. But that dollar amount is always there because there is a guaranteed funding that the board is supposed to provide to the fund to keep the funded or to guarantee the fund is 90% by 2045. It's a moving target. It increases every year. How do you intend to deal with this? Yeah. Well, it's, it's a major structural issue that, as you know, is hitting us square in the eye this year with this additional $70 million hit. Uh, just so the public knows, by 2010, without any change or any relief or reform, in the year 2010, that pension obligation grows to $200 million a year. And that's money that comes, by definition, straight out of the classroom. And so these are some tough, tough challenges. Uh, I'll just give you one idea. The state puts a billion dollars into the downstate pension fund each year. They put $75 million into Chicago. In state law, written in 1995, they were supposed to do 20 to 30 percent of what they do for downstate. If they do 20 to 30 percent of that, for us, that would be 200 to 300 million. Let me tell you, that would go a long way, and that was written in state law in 1995. And so there's lots of things we need to look at and explore together, but the bottom line is that this, is, this, you know, this could bankrupt us unless something changes. We cannot continue to take money out of the classroom to do this, and we have to think creatively, we have to think about some new ideas. And yet, wasn't that unfair that the state has to pay the state teachers where you, the system has to pay it's, it's absolutely, us? It's absolutely. And then the other challenge is, you know, we're, we're required to maintain a 90 percent funding ratio, as you know. I think the downstate pension fund is in the 40s. And so there's huge inequities in terms of what the requirements are, huge inequities in the amount of money going in. Again, a billion dollars downstate, 75 million to Chicago. Something's wrong with that picture. And yet, isn't it true that the governor took half of that this year the, to the state teachers? In other words, they only got $500 million instead of yeah, the billion I, I they were entitled the exact, to. I don't know the exact dollar on that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Next, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Curtis Harris. I'm a former Chicago Public School student. I did write you a letter last summer about the future of the special education program at John V. Lemoyne School. I want to thank your staff for, for sending me a letter back and keeping the school open for this year. Now, what is the status for the for special education program, particularly autistic, for the morning next fall? Yeah. Would they be there with the inter-American students? Yeah. Now, that, that program is there. What we try to do, as you know, is work very hard to create great regional centers for those autistic students. And we have a number of those around the city that I think are very high-quality programs. And we need to continue to work on those. But th that commitment remains. No question. Do you have plans for bringing back the early childhood program into the school? Um, as I talked about earlier, early childhood education is a huge push. This is one area where the governor has been very, very supportive. And we're trying to add over 2,000 sleets of uh, pre-K programs, three-year-olds and four-year-olds coming into public schools so they're ready to learn and ready to read by kindergarten. So we hope to continue that expansion and get up over 30,000 next year. Are you going to include special ed students in there? Yes, sir. One more question. Did the Corey H. settlement, from, are most of the students meeting the Corey H. criteria that students must be educated in the least restricting environment? Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, every, every special education student has what's called an IEP, an individual education plan, and we do everything we can to make sure that is followed absolutely to the letter of the law. That commitment has always been there. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. 
Superintendent Duncan, I'm Joyce Sachs, and I'm on the board of City Club. You mentioned that New York students get $4,000 more than our students on the average. Every year. Every Is there year. any evidence to show that it does any good, that they score higher? Because that would strengthen your case a lot. Well, I, 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 think, I think they're starting to show some progress. My, my basic point, though, is money doesn't solve the world's ills, but money is definitely a part of that equation. I think as I try to talk about, you need the resources, you need to have true, true accountability, which we have. You need to not throw good money after bad and close failing schools. You need to push innovation, and we've done that. But to say that Chicago that gets dramatically less money than whether it's wealthier suburban school districts, whether you can go right down the list, LA, New York, D.C. D.C. gets $16,000 per student. Think what we could do if we had just some more resources in terms of giving every child in Chicago the option to go to early childhood education. Think what we could do about reducing class size at the kindergarten to third grade level so we can ensure every child hit third grade at grade level. Think what we could do in terms of more after school programs and more summer school programs. Those things need resources and need new money. Good afternoon, Mr. Duncan, and also Mr. Scott. My name is Sharon Joy A. Jackson. I am currently the International President of the Pioneers Division for the Council for Exceptional Children. I am also their State Subdivision President, and I am President-elect of the Chicago Council for Exceptional Children, which is the largest chapter in the United States. And we would altruistically ask that both gentlemen not try to balance your budget on the backs of special education students. And I realize they may cost a lot, but they need a lot. And the idea that you would eliminate so many special education teachers and aid, aids rather, gives us pause. And we're not looking forward to the outcomes. We don't want them dumped, and I'm sure both gentlemen do not either. But this is very critical that they retain their legally mandated rights and needs, sir. And all three, both the division, subdivision, and city and Chicago Council are very willing to work with you and other members of the board to, again, protect their rights. Right now, as you know, the ratio should be 70% uh, percent of regular education students in a classroom and 30% uh, special ed. We're finding that these rates are not always the same. It could be 60-40, and this is quite unfortunate. You mentioned our IEPs. I'd like to mention FAPE and least restrictive environment, appropriate placement, et cetera, and I hope this looms large in any decision you might make. Thank you. I'm not quite sure what the question was there. Let me just be clear. I'm reaffirming of, something. Okay. That's all. Just to be clear, our intent, our intent is not to eliminate any teachers. Our intent is to come up with the resources so that we don't have to do these things. In, in terms of your willingness to partnership, I appreciate that. And the more you could talk to your state reps and your state legislators and let them know that we are really at a critical point here and we need them to step up and do the right thing. We have a short legislative session. Uh, we think Springfield is going to get out by like April 6th. So we got two and a half months, not a lot of time, where we really need to see something special happen there. And that's what we're here to talk about. Well, again, if we can be of any help, because we have been lobbying in the past, and it's not a new idea for us. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Eric Garr. Uh, I'm a partner in Diamond Cluster and a parent of a small person that hopefully will go to the Chicago Public Schools. Um, so I, I ask this question because I hire lots of college graduates, and oftentimes uh, we find their math and science skills lacking, and we have to spend a lot of time sort of rebuilding them, even after college. And when I talk to the universities that we recruit from, they say the problem starts earlier. So I wonder if you could highlight uh, what your plans are to really focus on uh, math and science education in Chicago public schools? It's a great question. A couple thoughts. Um, I talked about, one, doing the assessments this year in reading. We're coming back with assessments in math, third through eighth grade next year, system-wide, so we get a real sense of students' strengths and students' weaknesses. I talked about Lindblom High School earlier. What I didn't add is Lindblom is a math and science academy, and we want to create a series of math and science academies around the city to really serve those talented students and help them go to the next level. We've had areas of critical shortage. I talked about teacher shortages. One of those has been in math and sciences. So we've actually partnered very closely with the Golden Apple Foundation. We've done an alternative certification program. We have many engineers and people coming out of industry who are now taking 60, 70, 80 percent pay cuts and coming to teach in our Chicago public schools so that we have people with the content knowledge. We can help them on the classroom management, but people with the content knowledge coming in. It's a remarkable tool of, uh, pool of talent. The final thing I would say, and we could sort of go on and on on this, is we're pushing very, very 
hard to have more and more of our students take AP classes. We're seeing a dramatic increase in AP, not just uh, taking the classes, but getting it three or better, uh, particularly around math and science in, in high schools, whether it's magnet schools, neighborhood schools, whatever it might be, across the city. So I just say to say starting from you know, the third graders through to AP, through getting more talent coming in, we're really trying to, uh, m more new schools as well, really trying to take a comprehensive approach to this. As we know, we, we know the number of engineers coming out of India and China, we sort of read those numbers. We want our students to be able to compete. And so there's not one easy answer. There's a series of things we're trying to do right the way up to really make sure our students can compete, can come back and work with you so you don't have to export those jobs overseas. Great. Thanks. Vera Paul, our tech re, uh, director. I noticed that we all are here discussing reading and writing. 38 years at the Board of Education. I would like to know, and we know here that every child are not going to college. My question to you then is, what are we doing in our educational system for the vocational part of our children, just in case they want to be plumbers, electricians, blah, blah, and Redmond put that in to that. So what is your vocational motivation in all these schools, to, you know, the 15 charter, the, all of this? What are our kids getting that, are, that don't want to go to college and would like to have a good job when they leave the high school programs? Yeah, no, it's, a, it's a great, great question. It's one we're spending a lot of time thinking about. It's one the mayor is actually passionate about and continues to push us on. Um, what I, my basic goal is to create a range of great options at the high school level. As you said, students don't learn the same way. Historically, we sort of made them go to that right. local neighborhood school. And I want a menu of options. Let me just walk you through that. I want to have the selective enrollment option. I want to have the math and science option, the fine and performing arts, the international baccalaureate curriculum, which is great. I want to have a great voc ed option. I'll come back to that. For the first time ever, we can do single sex schools. We want to start to do, we're opening our first all boys school this fall. We want to do more of those going forward. We have military academies. Those have been very successful. So I want to create seven, eight, nine different options and let students and parents figure out what's the best learning environment for their child. We have one of our uh, most innovative charter schools. It's called Ace Tech Charter. It's the kind of school I'd love to have you come take a look at in the former Terrell building. It's a partnership between union and management. They're learning carpentry skills. They're learning to be architects. There's a whole range of things. And I think we know today, we don't know whether students are going to go right to work or go to college. We know more students than ever before are taking five, six, seven years to graduate from college. And so I sort of see this as false debates. I want to prepare college, uh, prepare our students both for higher education and for the world of work. And then let them figure out what's the right thing for them at their point in their life. We need to do a better job on both fronts. But I would love to have over the next three, four, five years, six world-class voc ed places spread throughout the city so that students with that interest and that aptitude will have great access to it. One more question. I can understand the charter school. But see, I, I'm not a charter school person. What public school, the outside of the charter school, that has a vocational program? Because I believe, like Booker T. Washington said, you get the skill, and then you use the skill to get the education, right. the BS. So outside of this one charter school, what public school, like Sin, like Harlem, like Bowen, that's south side that has a vocational program for our children in those areas. There's a whole series of them. Uh, Lane Tech has a great program. That's S not. S Simeon has great programs. Dunbar has a great culinary program. I could go through a laundry list of them, but the bottom line is I want to have more strong options. Your basic point is the right one. We need to do more in that area. As we start to create more new schools through the Renaissance 2010 initiative, we are actually uh, looking for national players who have a real expertise in this to come in and do more. There's an absolute need there that you identify. Thank Thank you. Let me ask a question, Arnie. <clears throat> My grandchildren in Milwaukee go to the, the, um, the public schools, but they are at home and they're educated via the internet. You had brought that idea up here. Would you explain it, please? Sure, we're absolutely trying to push the envelope on the new schools we're doing. And just as people talked about, we have Providence St. Mel who's going to open a school for us next year in the Englewood community. We're excited about that. 
We have the San Miguel group that's going to open schools on the west side for us. We think that's great. You have the University of Chicago contemplating another high school. So we have more players doing more types of new schools. Talked about the all-boys school. We're going to do that in the Englewood community. So there's lots of innovation going on. We're also going to open our first virtual school. And again, to go back to Diane's question, we're going to start small. 80, 100 students, but we think there's a market out there, and we'll see how that works. But again, there's students. Um, it's a fascinating, as, I, as we talk to the group that's going to do that, it's a really interesting mix of students, some of whom have special education needs and have problems sitting in class every day, some of whom are very gifted and need to be challenged more. So it's a, a real cross-section of students who might be drawn to it. But we're going to get in the game this fall and see how it goes, and I have high hopes for, for the, uh, doing more of that going forward. On behalf of the City Club and Jay Doherty, I want to offer you and give you an honorary one-year membership for your public policy luncheon contribution.